welcome to the History of Psychology show. I'm your host, Christopher Green, from York University in Toronto, Canada. Today, for our seventh show, we're going to talk with Dr. J.C. Young of Quest University in Squamish, British Columbia. A couple of years ago, J.C. and her co-author, Peter Hegarty, then of the University of Surrey in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, published an article titled, Reasonable Men, Sexual Harassment and Norms of Conduct in Social Psychology, in the journal Feminism and Psychology. So we're going to talk about that article in some detail and about the broader issue of sexual harassment in psychology. Then we're going to have a discussion of the fascinating little private university that uh, JC works at. I don't want to give too much away in advance, but uh, just as a little hint, uh, they don't have any departments at Quest University. So it'll be interesting to hear how that works. Um, I should confess right up front that JC, once upon a time, was a graduate student of mine, a doctoral student of mine at York University, um, but she has since made a name for herself with her research on sexual harassment in psychology, as well as other research that she's done. I hope you enjoy the discussion. So, JC Young, welcome to the History of Psychology show. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad we could have you. Um, um, let's get right into it. You and uh, Peter Hegarty uh, recently published an article titled Reasonable Men, Sexual Harassment and Norms of Conduct in Social Psychology in Feminism and Psychology. Um, and it's a really interesting article, and I think it blows the lid off some really important um, issues that we haven't discussed enough in, well, in the history of psychology and in psychology itself. So, so the article is divided up into three parts. Um, first is um, sexual harassment as part of the methodology of social psychology. And, and your main example there is Aronson and Mill's uh, 1959 severe uh, initiation experiment. Um, and the second part is about the study of sexual harassment by social psychologists and the difficulties into which that unexpectedly led. And, and finally, the third part is the um, history of sexual harassment by one prominent social psychologist uh, Henry Tajfell. Do we say Henry or Henri? Henri, as far as I know, at least. By Henri Tajfell. Um, so let's just go through each of those parts in turn. Um, so first, if you would, remind us of the details of Aronson and Mill's severe initiation experiment. For sure, yeah. So this is an experiment that was published in 1959. Um, and there's a number of reasons that this particular experiment stands out. One of them is just the fact that it's become one of these classic experiments within social psychology. So we have a number of classic experiments that the public would know as well, right? Things like the Stanford prison experiment or Milgram's experiments on obedience to authority. This is probably one that's more well known kind of within social psychology, but it is still one of those classic experiments. And so this was um, research that was undertaken by Elliot Aronson and Judson Mills um, during their graduate studies at Stanford with Leon Festinger. And this was one of those early studies that lent experimental evidence to support the theory of cognitive dissonance, which is probably uh, the most well-known theory in social psychology and something that, again, the public really is aware of, right? And so for this particular study, they set out to, you know, garner the support for cognitive dissonance, but the way in which they decided to do so was to bring young undergraduate women into the laboratory and expose them to what they called an embarrassment test. And this was an initiation process in order to join a larger group conversation on the psychology of sex, right? You're gonna join this conversation, but before we let you do so, you're gonna go through a kind of a test to make sure that you are capable of joining the conversation. And so they had a mild condition, but really the one of interest is the severe initiation condition, which they also called an embarrassment test. So this is how they framed it. And what it involved was these young women coming into the laboratory and reading to Aronson a list of sexually explicit words and also passages that were sexually graphic from uh, a, a contemporary novel. Um, and this was actually D.H. Lawrence's um, Lady Chatterley's Lover, which had been repeatedly banned in the United States and only published in 1959 itself. Um, and so, you know, the way in which this is framed is that, you know, you go through the severe initiation process um, and then 
the idea is having gone through this process, you're going to like the group you join more. And that's indeed what they found, right? But there is very much a lack of any sense that, you know, asking these young women to come into the laboratory and say these things to Aronson might be uncomfortable for their participants, right? It's very much framed as embarrassment. And it's really, you know, presented as inconsequential largely. Right. And so right. that's kind of the general setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, at the time, in the late 50s and early 60s, the main concern um, was not that this behavior towards women and participants, subjects, as they would have then been called, uh, was problematic or even unethical, but rather that the observed effect might be due to their having become sexually aroused rather than having been sexually harassed, yes? Yeah, so by the early 60s, there's a kind of critique of the particular experimental setup um, that's published along with a replication. And there, the social psychologists, you know, their critique is really rooted in the idea that, you know, this experiment, this embarrassment test cannot um, be unequivocally taken as support for cognitive dissonance because perhaps what's happening is these young women are becoming sexually aroused um, because, you know, women are known for kind of letting their emotions run away with from them. And so this is something that we should be cognizant of and let's replicate this, but with a different um, setup. And so they you know, end up exposing young women to electric shocks because this seems more, you know, less, more acceptable, less, <laughs> less problematic. <laughs> problematic in a different way, a different discussion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But interestingly, you and, and Peter point out that um, there was some doctoral research, at least, about the same time in which male subjects were presented with stimuli that might have seemed threatening to their own sexuality. Um, but the response to the uh, by the discipline was really quite different. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, very near the same period of time, another student working with uh, Festinger, Dana Bramble, was carrying out research also on cognitive dissonance, but in this case with young men who were um, being provided with false physiological feedback that indicated that they were aroused in response to seeing these photographs of men in states of undress is how it's phrased, right? And, um, you know, this study by Bramall very quickly became um, an example of unethical psychological research in conversations that, you know, took off in the 60s and 70s around some of those classic experiments about, you know, what are we doing to our participants here? Right. And this was very much singled out as problematic, right? What are we doing to these young men? Um, how are we harming their identities by providing them with this false feedback? Right. Right. So the point that you and Peter make here is that the sensibilities of so-called reasonable men held sway here, um, judging the manipulation to be uh, not ethically uh, problematic um, over the objections of women and, and that it went unrecognized that reasonable women might have a different and at least equally valid uh, perspective on the matter. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I think it's notable that, you know, the researchers here are all men um, and the participants who are being subjected to this embarrassment test, the severe initiation in the Aronson and Mills study are all young women. Um, and there really is, even across decades, no reflection on the part of the researchers that the, um, you know, the embarrassment test that they subjected these women to would be problematic. And so you get um, the Aronson and Mill study on severe initiation uh, singled out and upheld as this kind of epitome of good experimental design in the handbook of social psychology, which is this kind of, you know, foundational text of, um, you know, the discipline and repeated kind of again and again in the handbook, but also in textbooks and singled out as, you know, a good piece of research as a model of good, what good experimentation should be. And there really is this lack of reflexivity um, or reflectiveness around, you know, what is happening here and how it might be problematic for their participants. And so, yeah. Right. So, so the, so the problem here is, is that they, you know, are, are faced with this possible critique and then they make their judgment entirely on the basis of, you know, sort of their own sense of this, you know, their own authority as, you know, white male psychologists and the idea that somehow they have, they are not objective in this matter, but are coming from a particular perspective and that other perspectives might be different and valid just seems to never occur. It doesn't occur for decades and decades. Well, there is this real sense of gendered empathy that is happening within the discipline, 
at, so kind of at the disciplinary level, there is this ability to empathize with the male participants in Bramwell's research and you know express concern about them. But that kind of concern is just never expressed for the women in Aaron Smith Mill's study. And that's something that continues really into the 2010s where you know you get um, at various points in time, Elliot Aronson and Judson Mills reflecting on their research, but never expressing any concern for what transpired between themselves and the participants. And if anything, what gets singled out is the, the researcher's own discomfort with participating in that embarrassment test rather than the participants. As a rationale or justification for having done it, well, yeah, sure, the women were embarrassed, but I was embarrassed too. Is that sort of... Well, not even the first part, just the like, I found it really uncomfortable. So it must have been an effective way to produce the severe initiation, right? Right. 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 So one of the reasons I find this really interesting is sort of a personal story is that way back when I was an undergraduate and the ideas of sexual harassment were just sort of coming into view publicly, as it would have been in the early 80s, um, a fellow student and I, a woman, um, went out and decided to survey our local campus, women on our local campus, about what their experiences with sexual harassment. And we had a list of various you know, activities or, you know, things that might have been considered harassing. But in the end, we let them decide, uh, the, the respondents themselves decide whether they felt harassed or not. And we were quite surprised that something like, I don't remember the exact number, but something like 75% of the women said they had been sexually harassed on campus at one time. And so we thought this was an important finding and we went off to, you know, very authority figures on campus, our social psychology professor, we were both in a social psychology course at the time, which is why we had sort of started doing this. And, you know, the, the local student affairs, you know, officer on campus, all of the men, of course, and to a person, they all said, oh, well, this is an exaggeration and, and, and did sort of exactly the same thing you're talking about. They sort of replaced the the, the reports of the assessments of the women themselves as what to ha had happened to them with their own judgments as white male authority figures, we're older, we know more, and this isn't really a big problem and just kind of brushed us off. Um, and so I was quite struck by, by your description here that, that, that a very similar thing had happened. Hmm. Well, and your, your description there too very much reminds me of the work um, by Alexander Rutherford, who you've interviewed previously, yeah. but Alex has done this work on uh, rape surveys, right? And the kind of definitional problems there, where if you ask people about particular kinds of behaviors or experiences, they'll indicate that they've had those experiences, but they won't necessarily classify them as rape, right? Uh, even though they meet, say, the legal definition of rape. Right. And so I think those kind of definitional problems are really interesting to think about. Right. What does it mean for someone to have an experience that, you know, under a legal definition qualifies as as a particular category of behavior? But in terms of their own definition of that experience, there is that disjunction. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of complexities to those kind of definitional things. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think what's going on there is that the legal definitions are broader than their personal definitions? Or do you think that people who have experienced these things are just um, kind of, um, um, they, they don't want to use that word. They don't want to describe what happened to them with that particularly um, um, emotional word. And, and so they kind of narrow their definition of what counts as rape in response to their own uh, feelings about the events that happened to them. What, what do you think is going on? I mean, I think there's uh, probably a few different things going on. I think, you know, rape is a very loaded term to use and to apply to yourself, right, as something that you've experienced. Um, and so, you know, I think there's definitely um, pushback there. But I mean, also thinking about things like sexual harassment or sexual assault, these are things that are incredibly common experiences. So it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's, I think, really challenging to navigate those things and think about, you know, identity is wrapped up in some of those definitional terms and whether you apply them to yourselves. Um, and also, you know, it, particularly at the time period um, that we're looking at in the paper, these are terms that are very much, um, you know, coming into being. Um, and really the parameters of those definitions are being formed and shaped, even if the experiences themselves are not new kinds of experiences, right? Being right. sexually harassed in various ways is not something that's um, suddenly occurring in the 1970s as this term emerges. Right. Right. So that leads us really well into the second part of the paper where you talk about in the mid to late 1970s, sexual harassment emerging as a term in its own right, receiving some legal uh, recognition and becoming an important part of the American Psychological Association's new um, ethics code in uh, 1981. 
Um, and now that it was recognized as kind of an object, um, psychologists tried to study it, started to begin to study, uh, study it directly. Um, so could you tell us a bit about how that transformation took place and, uh, and about what you call in the article the ethical epistemological dilemma that researchers, often women themselves, encountered in doing these studies of sexual harassment? Yeah, so I mean, there's a few things happening here, right? So there is this emergence in the mid 1970s of the term itself, right? You, know, you get the term sexual harassment as a way to um, identify and raise consciousness around this kind of category of experience that women and other people have experienced for a long time, right? So this happens, but what's also happening during this period of the 1970s and 80s is a lot of kind of legal back and forth negotiating the parameters of this term and particularly kind of encompassing um, sexual harassment within the category of sex discrimination. And this becomes really crucial in a lot of these legal cases. And psychologists become involved in this kind of process as well by starting to undertake, particularly early on, studies of the prevalence of sexual harassment or of those behaviors that would fall within it. Um, but also, not long after, these um, studies about how men and women differ in their perceptions about what constitutes sexual harassment, right? And so this is where ideas like reasonable man and reasonable woman come into play, including in the courts, right? And so thinking about whose ideas of reasonableness hold sway in these situations or override other people's um, definitions of reasonableness is something that psychologists really do get involved in, um, particularly at that definitional level, right? Who gets to determine what is problematic behavior here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so early on, it's a lot of these kind of survey style results, right? Um, I think particularly as we move um, forward in time, you get occasional more experimental research on sexual harassment. And this is in particular where that kind of ethical epistemological dilemma comes into play for researchers, right? Um, so, I mean, if there is a, an ethical and epistemological question when we ask people about their experiences um, through surveys, but when we set out to create sexually harassing experiences in the laboratory that really bumps it up another level, right? Hmm. Um, and so there are limited um, pieces of research that set out to do this, including by bringing um, young psychologists into um, what they think are job interviews in order to work in a psychology lab, right? And asking them kind of invasive questions about um, sex. Right. Um, and so this kind of scenario where researchers themselves are crafting sexual harassment in order to study its effects and to study the way in which people think that they're going to respond in this situation versus how they actually respond in this situation comes with a lot of ethical dilemmas here. If we want to know things about sexual harassment is the way to know them through experimentation and kind of crafting these experiences in the laboratory. Right. And what are the ethical consequences of carrying that out for your participants. Right, right. So because I think it's significant that Aronson and Mills did this, um, but not because they had any interest in sex or sexual harassment, right? right? That was besides the point. All that they were interested in was this effect of severe initiation on liking for a group. Right. But in this case, it's because they actually have a uh, decided interest in the topic itself. Right. So the research has kind of reached around and bitten its own tail in an effort to find out more about sexual harassment, presumably so that you can limit it. Um, they have perpetrated it at the same time. And that's obviously. Problem. Right. Which raises real questions about, you know, is this something that psychologists should be engaged in? Right. Right. Are the benefits worth the kind of harms that, uh, that play out right and so what was the what 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 ha it's not you don't talk about it so much in the paper but what happens to that that problem do we have, do we still do uh research on sexual harassment that 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 falls into that trap or have we just started doing have we started studying sexual harassment in different ways or I mean, I would say the, the kind of experimental um, approaches to studying se sexual harassment, particularly these kind of in-person interactive um, right. experiences of sexual harassment are incredibly limited. There's maybe one or two examples in right. the literature. And is that because um, the ethics boards have just eliminated that as a category of permissible experimentation? 
I don't know if it's ethics boards per se. I mean, one could imagine that researchers who are interested in um, studying and addressing sexual harassment would themselves have ethical qualms about enacting that within a laboratory space. Right. Um, so there is a very limited sort of category of research that actually does that. Right. Um, but research on sexual harassment, I think, continues to be really dominated by either kind of imagined scenarios, right? Like, if this happened to you, how would you respond? Or that same kind of survey approach of, you know, how prevalent are these kinds of behaviors? Or how would, um, you know, how does that, again, that, that difference in um, perception about what constitutes sexual harassment um, play out a, across different groups of people? Right. And so what are your what are your thoughts about that is I'm sure there are some people who would think that even presenting someone with a scenario could be upsetting to them and therefore constitute some level of sexual harassment or at least of unethical behavior on the part of a researcher. How do you how do you see that? I mean, I think <laughs> I think that's probably a complicated question to answer yeah. um, for a number of reasons. I mean, maybe part of it goes back to, um, you know, do you know what you're getting into as a participant at the end of the day, right? Do you know that this is what is you're going to be uh, doing in the context of research, right. or is this something that's kind of sprung upon you? Um, you know, so I, if, the, I do, if the setup was, I'm going to be showing you uh, scenarios, I'm going to be describing to you scenarios of possible sexual harassment that might be upsetting to you. Are you willing to participate or not? Is that a way of? I mean, that's that's one way of approaching it and trying to. Um, you know, re reduce the kind of ethical dilemmas that come with that, I think. Right. But at the same time, you know, I, I do, you know, in, in this kind of research that, that takes on issues, topics that might be emotionally upsetting, I also, you know, am very hesitant to say there should be like a blanket, let's not investigate these things, because I think that's highly disruptive to this process too, right? So one thing that psychologists helped do with that early work on sexual harassment was to reify sexual harassment as this real thing, as this object that could be investigated. Mm -hmm. And I think that has um, real consequences in the world, especially if we look at some of the kind of legal cases around sexual harassment and how that gets navigated and defined in ways that then structure people's lives in important ways, including through things like um, Title IX in the United States, where you have a psychologist, Bernice Re uh, Resnick Sandler, who is instrumental in passing this legislation that really uh, regulates sex discrimination, and as a consequence, sexual harassment in educational spaces. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I'm very hesitant to say, like, like, let's not research this, but also because there is a kind of paternalism to that and saying, like, oh, uh, going back to that idea that women are overly emotional, that they couldn't handle, you know, reading an imagined scenario about these things, too, right? Of course, of course. Okay, that's interesting. So the third section of, of the paper, um, you finally arrive at this case of Henri Tajfel. Um, although he's very well known in Britain, um, in a survey that uh, Shane Martin and I published in 2017, he ranked as the third most important uh, psychologist uh, of all time among Europeans. Um, he's not very well known among North Americans, I find. So tell us a little bit about who Henry, Henry Taj, Henri Tajfel was and why he loomed so large over British social psychology in the 1970s. Yeah, so as you say, the kind of third section of this paper is this kind of case study of Tajfel. Um, and Tajfel was a um, social psychologist who worked, um, spent his career in Britain, um, and I think has had an, a kind of really influential, um, was really influential to the development of social psychology, not just in the UK, but also across Europe. So he helped found the European Association for Social Psychology, this very you know, um, important professional organization. He um, had one of the first chairs in social psychology in Britain at the University of Bristol. He trained a number of social psychologists. He, together with his former student, John Turner, proposed um, this theory, social identity theory, which remains influential today. Um, he also uh, you know, um, crafted another class classic experiments within social psychology, the minimal group experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and so was really instrumental in creating and, um, and making successful social psychology in Britain and Europe in the 1950s until his death in the early 80s. Yeah, I, I get the sense that he's in some sense regarded as kind of the father of social psychology in Britain, which didn't have as strong a tradition in social psychology as the U.S. had had through the 30s and 40s and 50s before that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. A, a real a leader in the field. And I think the other piece of that too is that, you know, his kind of academic and personal story really intersect in ways that have made him a very compelling figure. So in, um, you know, he was in Paris in, at university studying when the Second World War broke out. He ended up in a prisoner of war camp. Um, he was Polish and Jewish and his entire family then died in the Holocaust. And then his research became very much about unlocking how it is that people develop and express prejudice and discrimination, right? So he had this very much um, orientation towards addressing social issues that was motivated by those experiences in World War II and by his personal losses. And so that story I think has been very um, instrumental in kind of elevating him as a figure as well. Right, so, so you have this, towering and in some ways sympathetic figure um, who dies in 1981. And then stories start to emerge that he had been pretty much constantly sexually predatory with female students, both graduate and undergraduate. Could you recount some of their stories for us? For sure. Yeah. So, you know, maybe one entry point for this is how I kind of came across these stories themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this section of the paper is really built around a chance discovery on my part of a collection of oral history interviews um, that are held in Tajfell's papers at the Wellcome Library. And these are interviews that took place in uh, 1999. So, you know, almost two decades after Tajwell himself died um, with some of his former students and colleagues. And almost uniformly, they all speak about his problematic behavior with women, either having experienced it themselves or having witnessed it or known of it um, just in the environment. And so, you know, I was working on a different project entirely at this point in time, came across these tapes and then ended up developing this project on sexual harassment as a result of that. But at the time Toshville was alive, his behavior with women was really an open secret, um, at least within social psychology. So this was not something that people did not know about, but it wasn't something they you know, spoke publicly about. As you can imagine, if you were a student of Toshville's, this was not something um, that was easy to complain about. And so Toshville, you know, would sit next to women um, in meetings in his office, um, he had a, a divan in his office, a kind of day bed situation, and would suggest that, you know, the woman would be more comfortable if they went and sat on that bed, right? Um, his hands would make their way up women's legs, right? Like all of this kinds of behavior. He made inappropriate suggestions to go away for, um, you know, weekend trips um, with women. So there was a lot of kind of physical contact that was very much unwelcome in his, uh, when it came to his behavior. And it was something that women knew about and would warn each other about and would talk about. Um, and that also the men around him knew about. And yet the graduate students in particular um, that he trained were not in a position to make complaints about his behavior. As you can imagine, Tajfell was not simply their supervisor, but he was this huge figure within social psychology more broadly, right? Um, interestingly enough, perhaps, is that the one time he seems to have been called out for his behavior, um, it was by undergraduates, an undergraduate student, mm -hmm. who perhaps was, was in a, a position where um, their career was less directly um, impacted by Tajwell. And so what happened there? Like, so there, there, there I, I think we have to, I have to remind people who are listening that there were none of the structures, the sort of uh, institutional structures at that time to uh, complain about these things and have hearings about these things that there, that there are today. Um, there was barely the word to describe what was going on. The word sexual harassment itself wasn't really, was just coming, was just crystallizing at the time. And there was no person to complain to. So I guess one person, one of his students complains to the vice chancellor, is that who, which is the British equivalent of a university president in, in the US. And, and what happens then? So what happens then is that uh, Tajville gets called before the vice chancellor um, into a meeting and gets a bit of a dressing down uh, as, as is called from the, the vice chancellor about his conduct with, with students. Um, 
but ultimately doesn't suffer any professional consequences for this behavior. Um, so there was a recent, actually, um, biography of Tajfell published and included there is Tajfell's, um, a, a letter by Tajfell where he um, writes to the van vice chancellor after this meeting um, and kind of documents all of his um, important disciplinary positions, everything he's achieved and everything he brings to the university while dismissing um, in, in very strong language, the complaints of this woman, um, you know, essentially saying, who is she to complain? Um, and So he know, doesn't look, deny that it happened. He just says there is nothing here to complain about. Is that how it goes or? Yeah, it's not, there's, there's no explicit denial of his behavior. And certainly, you know, <clears throat> the one thing that came out of those um, oral history interviews as well is um, the sense that Tajfel was aware that his conduct with women was problematic, right? That he knew that he did these things that women did not enjoy that were problematic in those interactions and yet continued to do them anywhere way. Right, right. So it also seems that Tajfel was a bit of an intellectual bully as well. He's, there are stories about him sort of rudely interrupting or just walking out on students as they give accounts of their research if he thinks it's dull or inadequate. Do you think that his uh, intellectual bad behavior was related to his sexual bad behavior? Do these both spring from the same sort of underlying, I don't know, personality structure or do you see them as different things? Yeah, so there's this um, often told story about Taj Fell. And actually there was a, um, a BBC Mind Changers um, kind of podcast episode. So BBC Radio 4 has this program or had this program called Mind Changers. And they did an episode on Taj Fell's minimal group experiments. And the program actually ends by telling the story about how Taj Fell, when people came to Bristol to give talks and he would invite all of his connections to come and give talks. And he you know, knew everyone, right? In social psychology, both in Europe and in America. Um, but you know, people would come and give talks and those talks would take place in his office. Um, I, have, I have great difficulty kind of picturing what this office looked like, but apparently it was big enough to have this like day bed, but also like seminar space to give these talks. Um, and so the, you know, some, someone would come to give a talk about their research. And if Tajfell was bored or found this talk insufferable in some way, he would sit at his desk in the back of the room and he would start making phone calls, often in foreign languages, right? He would start talking in Polish to someone on the phone quite loudly, right? So there's this very kind of like rude behavior mm -hmm. when he just, you know, didn't find you someone worth engaging with or worth respecting. Um, and one way in which we frame this in the paper is in terms of thinking about a masculine ethos to the kind of scientific culture at play at Bristol. Um, that, you know, yes, Tajfell was sexually harassing women, but he was also just kind of domineering and a bully in general, right? He could be very charming, but he also, you know, was well aware of his own kind of status and position and would use that in ways um, that were unkind, if not, um, just terrible, quite right. frankly. Right. Um, and so there is this sense that, you know, there is a competitiveness, there's a, a dismissiveness, a rudeness, a bullying character to that particular intellectual environment, that scientific community um, that Tajfell really embodied and promoted through his conduct, whether as an intellectual bully or in terms of his behavior with women. Right. So I, I think in academia generally in, in that era, there was more of a masculinist ethos, if you like. There, there was uh, somehow the fact that we were doing intellectual work meant that we were able to speak more plainly than we would in, in everyday life. And so I'm wondering, do we, do we have some sense of whether he was, whether Tajfo was much worse than other mm. people of, you know, he had colleagues, there were two or three other colleagues in the department. Was he notably worse than everybody else? Or is this the same kind of thing that we see from, I don't know, in reports of Stanley Milgram or somebody like that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so one thing I think to keep in mind about the, the case example of Tajfell, and this is kind of how we deliberately framed it in the paper, was that our decision to kind of describe in great detail Tajfell's behavior here is really meant to serve as a case study or an example of broader kind of disciplinary patterns of these kind of masculinist scientific cultures, mm -hmm. right? So Tajfell and the stories about Tajfell are unique because they exist and have been preserved in these oral history interviews. And they are unique as well because it's not simply, you know, one oral history interview recounting the behavior of a psychologist, but rather a set of them that all kind of um, triangulate on 
on that behavior, right? And expose the kind of um, particular character of social psychology at this institution. And that really just doesn't exist elsewhere, even though we do know from other accounts, including through, you know, um, another project that I'm involved with, um, Psychology's Feminist Voices, which does oral history interviews, that being sexually harassed during this era was not a unique experience, right? This is something that happened all too often. And so Toshville becomes the central player in our story, really because there is this body of information about what it looked like um, at this university at this time in a way that just doesn't exist elsewhere. Right. There's, this is a problem. There's a version of this problem, which I guess exists all over um, historiography, um, the practice of doing history, because we don't have random samples and, you know, multiple uh, accounts. Sometimes we only have these singular, often we have only these singular accounts and we have to attempt to generalize to the best uh, we're able um, from a much narrower um, database, as a psychologist would say, um, than you can if you're doing, well, experimental work or something like that. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, and I think too, um, you know, one thing we don't have necessarily are the accounts from women who would have left the program because they were not willing to continue to put up with this behavior, right? They weren't willing to continue to go through this on a regular basis. Right. Um, and so those oral histories that are exist in that archive now are from women who stuck it out, right? Who continued right. through the program and went on to have careers in psychology. Right. But people who left are missing from the historical record as well. Right. And we can think of that, of course, beyond Tajville too. Um, but to go back to your question about whether Tajville's behavior was was um, unusual or extreme, there are repeated comments that it was, that it was more extreme than much of the, the behavior of other people, either in the departments or more broadly, right? Um, a number of the interviewees remark that this wasn't the first time they'd experienced some form of sexual harassment, right? Unwanted sexual attention, but it was more extreme in Tajville's case than it than other right. experiences. So, so in a sense, it's those historical actors who can kind of sample for us. We can't get the sample that we might want. But they, of course, knew other people, other professors had been in other situations at the same time in the same city. And so had a sense mm -hmm. of what the norms were for that time. And they can tell us whether or not this was an unusual uh, occurrence that was happening to them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Toshville was a strong advocate of experimentation in social psychology. Um, and he produced, he trained much of the next generation of, of, of British social psychologists. But a lot of them did not become advocates of, of experimentation. They began to adopt other um, approaches to studying social psychology. So I wonder whether you think there's some connection between these. Do you think that their um, distaste with Tajfel's uh, behavior spread to uh, a, a distaste for his methods? Or do you think it's just much more of a zeitgeist thing that they became involved with what was going on in Britain at the time and that's what led them away from experimentation and to other, other qualitative methods? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to make a one-to-one, -one, um, you know, causal connection here. Yeah. Um, but there, you know, there's a few things that I, I point to here. Um, one is just that, you know, more broadly, Toshful in his work was very uninterested in issues of gender. So he's very interested in thinking about kind of nationalism and racism in the context of prejudice and discrimination, mm -hmm. but the same kind of kind of process of group distinctions and the, the consequences of those distinctions when it came to gender was something that Toshville was uninterested in, saw as unimportant ultimately. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this has come up in conversations with people as well when we think about Tajfel's legacy and how to engage with his work, right? There's this, you know, ever present question of can we separate the, the scientist from the work they produce, right? And I think this is a good illustration of how the scientist um, it very much informs the character of that work, right? Reading that work and knowing things about Tajfel can very much inform how you approach and interpret that work and are made aware of kind of absences in that work as well. Um, in terms of experimentation, um, you know, I think this is very much intertwined with feminism and gender and feminist approaches to research. Um, so many of Tajfel's students, particularly his women students, go on to embrace qualitative and discursive approaches um, and to adopt um, projects that are more explicitly oriented towards gender and feminism. And I think those things are intertwined. Um, very much in the kind of epistemology behind carrying out particular forms of research. Um, 
But I think too, we can think about experimentation and, and what it involves in terms of adopting control and power over people and that kind of situational dynamic, right? And there is a kind of reflection there with sexual harassment as carried out by Taj Bell. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is a really complicated tapestry uh, and, and there's lots of nuances here and it may be unfair to ask you to, I don't know, sum it up and project forward. But the, the paper is interesting as it is, is, is mostly um, historical as you'd expect on a show like this. Um, you know, it's about the Aronson experiment and about early um, uh, attempts to study se uh, sexual harassment and about Henri Tajfel. Do you think, and, and the conclusion is there was a sexual harassment problem in social psychology in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s. How do you think that's evolved? Do you think that problem still exists? Has it evolved? Has it um, developed into new forms or is it, have things gotten better? What is your, your attitude towards social psychology as practice today? So, I mean, I wish I could say, I think things have gotten better. I, I don't. Um, I would say too, you know, the, the paper focuses on social psychology, but that's really a function in large part of the material that we're engaging with. This is not to say that social psychology um, is unique in having sexual harassment within it as a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, nor would I say that psychology is unique in that respect either, right? Um, you know, in terms of the timeline of this paper, it's interesting too that, you know, um, we began working on it in 2015 and then in the fall of 2017 the me too movement really took off as a public conversation mm -hmm. right um so the the kind of attention being given to issues of sexual harassment um really amped up um if you look though at things like surveys about the prevalence of sexual harassment within psychology um those prevalence rates really haven't changed much if at all um I think there is a question to be asked about the kind of um, you know, shape of sexual harassment and how that may have changed, you know, what that actually looks like in practice. Um, I think too, we can think about how um, kind of at a surface level, um, there may be more um, prohibitions and norms against sexual harassment, right? That it would not be as blatant as it once was. Right. Um, and yet it is still very much taking place. And so so if we look even at recent cases within psychology departments, um, there's some really extreme examples of sexual harassment as really kind of normative and, um, and dominant. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the case at Dartmouth University um, a year or two ago that led to multiple faculty resigning and a, a lawsuit, right? Um, and this, you know, again, I would not take to be unique. What is unique so often is that these things become public, right? Um, and so I think for every public case that we see, there's going to be a lot more happening behind the scenes of various institutions that just never comes to that kind of light. Right. So when, at, at a time when uh, it didn't need to be discreet, it was indiscreet, but now it's gone underground, but has not changed fundamentally. Well, and I think too, you know, a lot of what happens, and this would have happened to, you know, in, in Tajbell's era, is there is a lot of kind of corridor talk about who to avoid, who not to be alone with, right? Um, that, you know, the kind of structures that allow sexual harassment have not gone away. And, you know, here we can think particularly of the very hierarchical structure, both of say the lab, but also the university itself, right? Those kind of power dynamics are very much still in play and very much still allow this kind of harassing behavior to proliferate if people in positions of power are um, insulated from the consequences of their actions. Right. Right. Well, it's a really important paper, and I hope uh, our uh, listeners uh, take the time to read it when they get a chance. I'd like to talk next about you a bit, about your backstory and, and, and how you came to, to this position, this place. Um, so where were you born and raised? I was born in the very center of Canada in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Which is um, where you are right now. It is where I am right now. Yes, it's uh, it's very cold outside, uh, which you can automatically know in the winter in Winterpeg, as it is sometimes known, because uh, it is incredibly blue sky and sunny out. That is an indication that it is freezing because it is too cold for clouds to form. That's right. Be beautiful, but humans cannot survive it. I mean, you, you figure out how to do it. It's not that bad. <laughs> I prefer, I actually prefer a Winnipeg winter to say a Toronto winter. It's well, a dry cold. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're kind of gray and minus five-ish like we've been for a long but time. But wet. It's always so wet. It's wet and gray and dark and yeah. 
no, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. Um, and, and so were your, you were born in Winnipeg and raised in Winnipeg. Were your parents academically inclined? No. Um, you know, my, um, my father never finished high school. My mother did a little bit of university, but kind of never pursued that further. Um, I would say, you know, the, the more academic inclinations of my family are further back than that. I have a, a great aunt and uncle who are both retired university professors, right. um, but kind of more my immediate family, not, not so much. Yeah. Right. And so um, was going to university uh, uh, an obvious thing for you to do, or was there kind of a, a story there about how you decided to go to university? I mean, I think there was an expectation probably that, uh, you know, we would go to university, my sister and I, as, as children, as kind of the I don't know, default path of children of that era. Mm -hmm. um, and there was certainly a sense uh, uh, that I was smart, right, within my family, that mm -hmm. you're smart, so you're going to go to university and do all that and, and succeed in some way. Um, but yeah, it was it, it was uh, it was also something I was motivated to do. I mean, it was I, I was always interested in school and engaged in that way. And school was something I enjoyed, and I ended up staying in school for a very long time. Right? Like this Your was enjoyable life. to me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've yet to really leave the university. So yeah, yeah. yeah so and and you went to where did you end up going? So I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Winnipeg. So you stayed in, in town. Um, um, was that a conscious decision or did you not want to go away or? I mean, it was, I would say largely a financial decision. Yeah. I, I applied to a few other universities, um, but really, you know, there was a lot to be said to, to being able to live at home while an undergrad. Uh, at the time as well, Manitoba had quite low tuitions, the lowest outside of Quebec. Right. And you would know how low Quebec is, right? Oh, I remember. Um, so it was very affordable for me to, you know, go to this university. Um, yeah. Yeah. And were you immediately drawn to psychology or was there, did you, no. were there stops along the way? Uh, there were a lot of stops along the way. I think I, I began my undergraduate degree um, thinking that I was going to do a, an English degree. And so I took a lot of English classes, classes in this initially, but I also, you know, I did the thing that so many students do and I took an intro psych class. Right. Um, and then, you know, I ended up taking a few more classes, um, including classes with professors that had um, unusual approaches to teaching their classes. So I had a professor, you know, I took a, like an intro developmental psychology class and we read The Origin of Species and uh, Jean Piaget, right? Like it was a very kind of primary text, more, um, more theoretical approach. That's really unusual these things. for psychology, for psychology departments actually. That's oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I, I kind of got interested um, through through some of those classes into in the more kind of historical side of things, but I also took, um, you know, so the University of Winnipeg is this you know undergraduate liberal arts university, and one of the requirements is that you take a, a math or science class, even if you're doing uh, more of a humanities or social science degree. Mm -hmm. And so one of the options was to take a history of science class. So I took that as my kind of science requirements, um, and I enjoyed that quite a bit. And I ended up taking a history of medicine class as well, and a few other history classes. Um, and then at some point along this path, I discovered that the history of psychology was a thing. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a thing. And, uh, and it kind of went, spiraled from there, I guess. So do you remember how you found out about the, uh, so I, I, I mentioned this in the introduction, but I should, uh, you know, fess up again that, that JC ended up being my uh, master's yes. and PhD student at York University. How did you find out about that program at York University? Do you remember? I, I want to say that I found out about, about it through um, CPA, the Canadian Psychological Association used to put out, and I don't know if they still do, but like a book on graduate programs oh, yeah. in psychology. And so I want to say that I like found it in there. I don't really know don't why remember. I was looking in there, like how I you know, ended up at the York University entry. Um, Fair enough. I don't remember how I found out about this program either, to tell you the truth. So. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I found out about that and that kind of, you know, really, um, you know, hooked me in and I was like, oh, you could, you could do that. Um, right. And then ended up applying uh, both to York and the University of Calgary had a theoretical psychology program. That's uh, right. That Hank to. Sam and uh, mm -hmm. people like that. Yeah. Um, so now that's interesting. Uh, so you came to your to do history and theory when we were talking to Kathy Fay a few weeks ago. Um, she said that she actually came be primarily because she wanted to live in Toronto. And oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> and the history and theory. Actually, she applied to social psychology and got into. Mm -hmm. We picked her up in history and theory um, instead. But but you actually came to do history and theory. That was the thing you were looking for when you came. 
I did. I did. I had a not been to Toronto before, unless you count the airport, which I do not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, but my uh, great aunt and, and uncle, who I mentioned, are retired academics, um, lived in Toronto. So I had a, a kind of tangential connection there through yeah. them. Right. Um, and but, you had yeah. some local, some people you were familiar with nearby. So it wasn't just yeah. landing in a city you'd never been in before and, and trying to make your way. So do you remember what your impressions were of graduate school? The transition from undergraduate to graduate school is often really uh, fraught for some people. And for other people, it's full of joy. Do you remember how you, did you just come and just put your head down and do your work or was there? I mean, I, it was definitely a transition. Um, you know, it was also my first time like living on my own um, and all of that as well. Um, but it was, I think, I think, you know, I would say it was largely a positive transition. It was definitely different to like live in Toronto as opposed to living in Winnipeg. Yeah. Um, and even the university, right, is so much larger um, than my undergraduate institution. So that was kind of definitely a different just scale of, of things to navigate. Yeah, but yeah I, I, think, don't think many, I don't think many people realize that York University, because the University of Toronto um, looms so large um, in this city, I don't think, think people realize that York University is 50 or 60,000 students. It's an enormous, enormous university. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, at the time that I went to University of Winnipeg, it was maybe five or 6,000. Right. Um, so it was, you know, quite a bit different. <laughs> so about as big as the psychology department at York yeah, University. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But I mean, um, I think I, I started in the program at a really um, opportune time, just in that the kind of cohort of graduate students there um, was really welcome coming and we ended up developing really strong friendships that continue to this day and so that I think was really um, uh, you know a lucky a lucky stroke you, you know I find that true of everybody I mean I've been out of graduate school for you know 20 years 25 years and um, some of my strongest friendships are friendships that I made still are friendships that I made in graduate school there's something about graduate school the bonding in graduate school that lasts a long time especially if you and your friends stay in academia right and you mm. meet each other at conferences from time to time and now we zoom all the time I can see I, everybody yeah. else yeah <clears throat> so what was your uh, master's research on do you remember I remember do you remember you were my supervisor Chris do you I, remember I, this I do I, I, <laughs> interviewers have to play a little dumb so <laughs> Uh, yes. So, and, and this is, uh, this is also interesting to me and I can't quite remember how this played out, but I had applied to the program interested in doing something on James Mark Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I can't remember exactly how I came across Baldwin in my undergraduate degree, but somewhere along the line. I yeah, he's an unusual Baldwin. figure for undergraduates to know about because he doesn't get taught about very much. Yeah, yeah, like somewhere I come across him. And so I was interested in doing a project on James Mark Baldwin. Um, and it kind of, um, you know, became this project about his theory of organic selection. Um, and also kind of expanded to other figures, particularly um, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who kind of simultaneously proposed this theory. Um, and so that, that was a really, um, I think good introductory project for me that right. was very attainable in a lot of ways. Right. You know, I was able to go to New York City and do some archival research for the first time as well at the uh, American Museum of Natural History. Right, which is where Osborne uh, was the president. Yes, was that? Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And for people who don't know James Mark Baldwin, he was a uh, developmental psychologist who spent some time at the University of Toronto, but most of his career was at Princeton where he'd gotten his PhD and later at uh, Johns Hopkins. Yes, and then he had, uh, as so many did at Johns Hopkins, a sex scandal and uh, fled the country. So, you yes. know. The three great psychology sex scandals at Johns Hopkins. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was your master's and then, and then you moved on in your PhD to do what? Yeah, so for my, my dissertation research, I ended up doing a project all about the history of uh, questionnaires in psychology, which actually um, is rooted in, in that master's research at the American Museum of Natural History, mm -hmm. where I came across this questionnaire that Henry Fairfield Osborne had done um, very early in his career um, in the 1880s, and uh, kind of got really interested in this kind of way of accumulating psychological information via questionnaire, right? right. And so that really kind of uh, snowballed into this much broader project about the place of questionnaires in early American psychology and all the way up until the development of Likert scales in the 1930s. Right. Right. Well, I, I get when we think of, of the history of questionnaires, I think we nor we normally think of sort of psychometrics and kind of the early 20th century. But what you found was that there was this whole earlier 
a history of questionnaires for 20 or 30 years before we ever got to the point of, of using statistics to analyze the, those kinds of data. Absolutely. And so much of this oriented around collecting very descriptive kind of uh, information, right? What we would now call qualitative. Right. Um, but really these kind of open-ended questions that people could respond, you know, in short sentences or write pages and pages to, right. and that often happened as well. Right. So wasn't there um, one, didn't William James do one on the paranormal where he got back reams and reams of information and was ultimately unable to really say like encapsulate it in any way it just was this giant wealth of data that he couldn't really do much with absolutely yeah so james actually did multiple questionnaire projects um the the largest being this one that he did for the um american society for psychical research um where he just kind of threw up his hands and was like i don't know what to do with this you deal with it uh, at a certain point which is not, probably not surprising for james really um right but but yeah a lot of um you know the big figures in early American psychology um, adopted questionnaires um, at least once or twice in some of their research, including James Mark Baldwin. He did one on imitation, which if anyone knows Baldwin's work is not surprising, um, but also, you know, Mary Whitten Calkins, um, Joseph Jastrow, uh, James, as you mentioned, Josoya Royce. Um, yeah, yeah. G. Stanley Hall being the one who probably did the most questionnaires right. of, of anyone. It's kind of that 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 Eastern mid-Atlantic, New England to mid-Atlantic kind of gang of, of turn of the 20th century uh, psychologists. And they were yeah. all involved at one time or another in, in questionnaire research. Absolutely. And it was, I mean, I think, you know, the thing there is that it was just so easy to do at some level, right? right. Um, you know, anyone can write up a, a list of questions and circulate it. The, the problem really came in at the point of interpretation, right? Like, what do you do with all of this once right. you've uh, amassed it? So how did they circulate it? Did they publish it in newspapers or magazines or something? Or how did they? Yeah, I mean, they were de dependent on the, the project. Some were published in things like science um, and other kind of periodicals um, right. with a request for people to mail in their answers. Right, which was, um, owned, others, science was owned by James McKean Cattell at the time. So it had a strong psychological connection. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, particularly with um, G. Stanley Hall, he had kind of a, a network of educators and pedagogically kind of oriented researchers that he would tap into and send these things off to, um, including some who that would circulate among, um, you know, students at normal schools, those in teacher training, right? right. Um, and so it was a lot of pedagogically inclined projects, particularly for Stanley Hall. Right. So in addition to doing a master's thesis and a, and a PhD dissertation, you also worked um, quite intensively with Alexandra Rutherford at uh, Psychology's Feminist Voices, doing interviews and, and writing biographies and things. Tell us a bit about that work. Yeah. So, you know, I've been involved in Psychology's Feminist Voices for over a decade now. That started, um, I guess, early days of my, my PhD work. Um, and, you know, the project... Uh, you know, had just launched online as a website. Um, and the project involves both kind of these profiles about women in the history of psychology, as well as more, um, you know, these oral history interviews with more contemporary figures in feminist psychology. And so I've done a number of, of different things for the project over the years. I've written a number of more historical profiles of women, um, you know, some with, you know, fun names like uh, Psyche Cattell, you can go and explore about her. Psyche um, Cattell. Right, like, yeah, but like, I, I don't even know who I wrote about. I don't think I actually wrote the Cattell one, but uh, you know, so many you, figures there. Do you remember a, a, either a particular profile or a particular interview that was particularly interesting for you? Well, one um, profile that I ended up writing was on a psychologist uh, based at the University of Toronto, Mary Northway, mm -hmm. um, which ended up being um, something that together with that profile and the profile of another psychologist who started this organization called Children's International Summer, Summer Villages really set up this other research project on kind of small group research, much of it oriented around children. Um, so I think a lot of the psychology of voice work, voices work has been really um, fruitful for me in a number of ways, both in kind of producing material for the project itself, but also then spurring other research projects that I would not have anticipated um, you know, at the outset of my involvement there. Right. Um, 
And, you know, it was also a really great opportunity to get experience conducting oral history interviews with folks, um, including, you know, some really interesting folks. You know, I did an interview with a psychologist, Lucia Gilbert, um, a few years ago, who, you know, before interviewing her, I didn't know anything about. And then you get to know so much about these people in the interview process. Right. So after you graduated, you um, went off and did a postdoc with Peter Hegarty, who I guess at the time was at University of Sussex, but now is at the Open University. Um, and that was on an entirely different topic as well. Yes. Yeah. So I went to do this postdoc with Peter Hegarty, who was at the University of Surrey at that point. Oh, Surrey. Just, Sorry, not Sussex. Yeah. The other S school, right? Um, and is now at the, uh, the Open University. Um, and so the, the project there is I, you know, I was working on my dissertation and, you know, doing what graduate students do, which is try to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, and so I applied for um, a SHRC, uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, uh, postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and, uh, you know, as part of this process, you write up a project proposal. And so what had happened through some of that work that I had done, um, on this Psychology Feminist Voices project was that I got really interested in these kind of small group projects, um, small group research that had been carried out um, in the kind of first half of the 20th century into the 1970s even ultimately. Um, a lot of it oriented around understanding um, democracy, right? And how to kind of um, inculcate democratic uh, orientations into young children mm -hmm. um, and also how to you know, prevent things like prejudice and discrimination by fostering contact um, of different kinds of children um, through different groups. So the, and, like would Sheriff's Robbers Cave be an example yeah. of this? But you found that there had been all kinds of different projects that were similar to that in various ways, yeah? Yeah, and a lot of these also taking place in kind of natural environments, right? So Sharif's Robbers Cave study at a you know boys camp um, in Oklahoma, um, although there are previous iterations of that that took place in New York State and Connecticut, um, but also other projects that took place at camps or, um, or other kind of wilderness settings or quasi wilderness settings, right, that were very constructed um, and yet were very much framed in terms of the kind of naturalness of the interactions between children or groups of children that were put in these environments. Um, and so that was kind of, um, the framework for this postdoctoral project. And it was that project that was meant to end actually with Ari Tajfel and his minimal group experiment, which was not taking place in nature, but was meant to really strip down these kinds of group structures to their bare bone components, right? To get to kind of the real essential nature of, of groups and group formations. Um, and that's how I ended up in the Tajfel papers at the Wellcome Library in London and came across those audio cassettes of the oral history interviews, which then just took a, 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 real, a real turn in terms of research projects. Right, right. Um... So then, happily, you landed a, a job, a professor's position, at this really interesting little university um, in British Columbia called Quest, where, as I understand it, there aren't really departments and majors and all that stuff that we associate with sort of the North American university system. It's, it's quite different. Could you tell us a bit about how that university works? Yeah, so it's a, it's a tiny, not-for-profit, uh, liberal arts university. Um, that's very interdisciplinary in its orientation. So as you said, we don't have departments. Um, we have area groups, um, but that's you know, really broad, right? It's the social sciences, the humanities. Um, but a lot of the, um, the focus of, uh, of education at the institution is really interdisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary um, whether in terms of specific courses themselves or more broadly, the kind of... Um, conglomerates of courses that students take over the course of their degree. So the first two years of the degree program, um, all students take a set of foundation courses that are meant to kind of root them in interdisciplinarity. So they take social science classes, humanities, physical sciences, life sciences, math, um, before moving on to more specialized studies. And um, they kind of design their own degree ultimately by figuring out what is of interest to them. Um, and then figuring you out what courses they're going to take. system that most schools have where it's got to take these two courses and then after that you're allowed to take these ones. And, and the courses are, I guess, not, not the standard topics, but the professors kind of design uh, uh, courses around topics that they're interested in. 
So it's not like yeah. cognitive psychology, but it's something else. Yeah, it's a it's often kind of a hybrid between things, right? So maybe there's a cognitive psychology course, but it has a more specific focus um, than sort of an intro cognitive psychology course um, mm -hmm. because of the way in which the university is structured. Um, and yeah, it's it's really it's a really interesting place to teach ultimately. Can you give us an example? I was going to offer a, a possibility. So, like, if you were teaching memory, you wouldn't just do memory uh, experimentation, but you might do I don't know Proust, or you know, you'd add on these ways of looking at memory from I don't know everything from neuroscience to literature and put them together. Is that the kind of thing that would happen there? Um, it can happen. So there are sort of specifically interdisciplinary courses, um, sometimes actually co-taught or team taught uh, at the institution that might bring in multiple different disciplines and perspectives into one course. Um, but there are also courses that are, are, you know, taught individually that are a little more focused and still kind of within a discipline, but more targeted in their focus. So right. I think well, I suppose it would be difficult to find talent to find professors who actually have that range of dis interdisciplinarity themselves. And so having multiple people who uh, get along together and can, and can produce a, a, a broader course would be the way. Of, so can you give us an example of a course that you've taught and sort of the materials that you use and that sure, this kind of interdisciplinarity? Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll tell you a bit about the course I just finished teaching earlier this week, which is a, a kind of foundation level course that students would take in their first two years at the university. And it's an introductory kind of social science course, and it's called Global Perspectives. Um, and so it's meant to, you know, move beyond kind of North American framing of, um, of issues. Um, and when I teach the course, my focus is on mental health and global perspective. So the course itself involves readings that are, you know, from psychology, but also anthropology and sociology and a little bit of geography. Um, and we spend most of our time talking about places other than North America and Europe. Um, so we read a book on the Americanization of mental health elsewhere in the globe. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about kind of healing practices when it comes to mental health that are not specific um, to the kind of American perspectives on mental health. Uh, we talk about the social construction of mental illness. We talk about the DSM and all the kind of controversies around that. Um, and we also think about um, things like uh, what's called the global movement for mental health, um, which again has a very kind of Western American orientation in terms of exporting this kind of mental health expertise to other places of the world. And then we engage with critiques of that and think about, you know, what, is it, what does mental health look like? Right. in various places and, and what are the kind of healing practices that get adopted and so we talk about things like uh, mindfulness right and critiques of the kind of American co-option of mindfulness um, but also things like indigenous healing practices um, we talk about kind of neoliberalism and psychopharmaceuticals and um, the problems with applying you know that globally um, yeah so it's a fun class and students uh, seem to engage with it. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. I, I would think even the phrase mental health kind of uh, has the same kinds of problems that, that you're talking about there, that we're talking about a mind rather than a spirit or a soul or whatever word is used in the particular language you're, you're talking of, and that it's an illness, it's a health illness mm -hmm. problem rather than a religious problem or a, I don't know, connection to the universe problem or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So we read, um, you know, Thomas Saz on the myth of mental illness very early on in the course, um, who invokes the idea of thinking about what are called mental illnesses as problems in living, right? And so this is a term that we kind of keep invoking throughout the class, right? Is this mental illness? Is it a problem in living? How do we think about these things, right? Who's framing it as a mental illness? Right. Um, it sort of gives you a, a, a more neutral term, problems in living, that doesn't immediately imply mentality and illness health as the as the main focus yeah yeah and so we end up kind of flipping back and forth a lot between thinking about you know individual experiences the meaning of those experiences within a particular cultural context um but also thinking about like the social um factors the economic factors that often produce some of that kind of um, suffering that people may be experiencing right so what kind of degree do students end up with? It isn't going to be a bachelor's degree in psychology or geography or whatever. It's going to be broader. How do they characterize the degrees? So students at the university earn a bachelor's of arts and sciences. Um, so kind of 
a broad de degree. Um, but what happens about halfway through their program is students take a course called Question, where they have to develop their own question that they're going to kind of focus on for the remainder of their degree. Um, and then they kind of build their academic program around that, you know, what classes they're going to take, what things they're going to read. And then ultimately they produce what's called a keystone project. There's kind of a, a quest lingo around a lot of this that you have to learn as I, as I did when I started at the university. Um, but it's, it's kind of a thesis project. It doesn't have to be original research necessarily. It can also be, you know, a creative work. Um, there's a lot of freedom in what this actually looks like, but it's all oriented around or, or building off of that initial question um, to produce some you know, some project. Um, and, and do the, the projects, the thesis-like projects um, themselves exemplify this interdisciplinary uh, focus? Yes, yeah, yeah, for the most part. I mean, there, there are necessarily projects that are a bit more disciplinary than others, yeah. but that is kind of built into the degree program itself in such a way that um, it's really difficult for students to produce something that is, you know, singularly a specific discipline ultimately. Well, interestingly, they've been trained in a way that doesn't, so, so that their thought isn't necessarily um, wrapped around disciplines in the way that, that standard education is. And so they may not see the boundaries, feel, if you like, the boundaries between disciplines in the same way that a lot of uh, the rest of us do. Yeah, and there's a real orientation towards, I think, thinking through, you know, why does this matter to the, the broader world, the broader community, right? What are the consequences of whatever you're, you're writing about in your Keystone project? And those kinds of questions um, almost always get taken up by students in the projects. Yeah. So um, do your students go on to, do some of your students go on to graduate school and how do they navigate that without having sort of the usual markers of disciplinarity that get you into graduate school? Um, it really depends on, you know, what, what students are pursuing. So students have, have absolutely gone on to graduate school and medical school and law school. Um, depending on the requirements for various programs, sometimes students um, end up taking additional classes to meet those requirements. Um, but there is also, you know, it's not uncommon to write a reference letter where you have to explain what this university is in the first place, right? Like, this is how this works. Right. Here are the things students have taken and how they um, have satisfied a lot of the kind of... Uh, material or intent behind those uh, program requirements through the kind of unique structure of the institution. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the student and, um, you know, how far in advance they are aware of where they want to end up in graduate school, you can be quite deliberate in their courses and course selection, or maybe they go, um, <clears throat> well, in non-COVID times, you know, go on exchange somewhere and, and take courses that will meet some of those requirements. Right. Uh, Quest is a private university, which is kind of unusual in, in Canada compared to, to the U.S. Um, so I have to ask the question, how much is tuition at Quest University? I think it's currently thirty-five or $36,000 a, a year, not okay. including um, room and board. And right. most of our so students not, are residential in non-COVID times. Not, not dissimilar to what uh, some of the American private universities are then, except in Canadian dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so far as I know, it is still the most expensive undergraduate uh, education in Canada. Yeah, but but really interesting. Well, I think that's a really nice place to wrap it up. I want to thank you very much for spending this time with us. For sure. It was a pleasure to be here. All right. Take care. So that's all for our seventh episode of the History of Psychology show. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. J.C. Young for having spent some time with us and uh, remind you that you can always leave comments in the uh, YouTube window. Uh, we'd love to hear what you think about the show um, and remind you that it will be two weeks until we have our next show. Um, hope to see you then. Bye-bye.